Good, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this very exciting panel, panel with the World Economic Forum and CNBC News. My name is Hadley Gamble, and thank you so much for joining us. Now, today we're in the middle of the fourth industrial revolution, and technology is changing everything. It's changing how we work, how we live, and certainly even how we relate to one another. The future is all about communication, and let's face it, right now, what we have is some serious failure to communicate. Now, in terms of the multilateral world order that we've seen since the Second World War, it's being ripped up, and countries are going it alone. They're going it alone on trade, they're going it alone on defense as well, and truly failing to address so many of the issues that are pressing today, including climate change, um, global humanitarian crises, and serious income inequality. Globalization 4.0 is really about addressing these shifting balances of power. It's really about creating an architecture, whether it's geoeconomic geo or, frankly, um, the, the way that we communicate in the future to address these problems. I'd like to introduce our panel. Julie Bishop is a member of parliament uh, for Australia. Bill Burns, of course, president of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Koriko Kawajuki, visiting professor and fellow at the Musashino Institute for Global Affairs in Japan. Miroslav Legic, the Minister of Foreign and European Affairs of the Slovak Republic, and Susanna Malkora, who was formerly the Minister of Foreign Affairs in Argentina. Welcome, panelists. I'd like to kick off now with Julie. We were talking just a little bit earlier in the green room about what's going to happen next to address the challenges of the future, what has to happen, whether it be geostrategic, geoeconomic. It's about rules-based orders that have to be upended. Where do we go from here? During my time as Foreign Minister of Australia between 2013 and just the other day, I <laughs> observed a significant convergence of challenges that is overlaid by the fourth industrial revolution. So while we've got technological advances disrupting the way we live and work at a pace and scale unprecedented in human history, we're also seeing some geopolitical, geostrategic trends that uh, manifest in ways that challenge that rules-based order. Now, by the international rules-based order, I mean that network of alliances and uh, treaties and norms and conventions underpinned by international law that evolved since the Second World War. And I think it's... Um, noteworthy that we're meeting today on the 100th anniversary of the end of the First World War, which was followed by the Second World War. And after that, the nations of the world came together and said, we need a framework to guide how nations behave and towards each other. Now, my challenge is to nations that are seeking to undermine that rules-based order, or to nations that say, uh, we can go it alone, or we can cherry pick which parts of the order we will accept or will be guided by and which we will not. What is the alternative? And I'm yet to see an alternative model that can deal with the challenges of global cooperation, global competition, and some of the issues like uh, climate change. So, I would say to those leaders and policy makers that are critical of the international rules-based order, what would you put in its place? Why not embrace and defend and uphold the international rules-based order, but adapt it, make it more flexible, make it more um, able to deal with the changes in relative power, the shifts in um, power relativities, to deal with the mass movement of people, displaced people around the world, to deal with issues like the rise of populism and uh, protectionism and nationalism that have short-term benefits, maybe, for short-term political advantage, but history has shown have a detrimental impact. So I think the starting point has to be to appreciate what it is that the international rules-based order has delivered in terms of the growth in human development and the fact that we've avoided a third 
global conflict and that standards of living around the world have lifted, hundreds of millions of people have been lifted out of poverty, and what parts of that order need to be adapted and adjusted. I'm not part of the debate that supports throwing the order out. Um, I don't believe there's a model on the table that can replace it, but we have to take into account the changing um, power structures and relativities to ensure that that order can be resilient and continue. Susanna, we've heard from Klaus Schwab, who has said that we are unprepared for globalization 4.0. But you've called this change and evolution a renaissance. What do you mean by that? <laughs> yes, I do use the word renaissance. And, and interesting, uh, because uh, I think we are at a point where we can break everything and all hell will break loose or we can work together to find and redefine the way we move forward. Uh, some people will, will argue that in order to get to the Renaissance, you have to go through the Dark Ages. So um, that is a way to see it, and maybe these tensions we see these days are part of a little bit of the Dark Ages. I will say that after 70 years, 70 plus years of the platforms that we collectively created, there is a need for change. It is evident that the institutions are not addressing the issues at hand. It is clear in my view that the, the pace of change is such that there is not enough adaptability in the institutional frameworks we have. So let's see how to produce the so much needed changes in a way that is collective and shared. The notion of zero-sum game for me is, is a loose proposition. It is also true that citizens do not always see themselves represented in these institutions. So let's make sure that we broaden the base of the institutional arrangements we have so that citizens see themselves there, the private sector sees itself there. I mean, the level of participation, the stakeholders must be much larger in order to represent not only the balance of power, which is there today, but the balance of views that is there today. So I will argue that we have a big challenge before us, which is not to break things, without having a way forward. But I will also argue that this is needed at a speed that is a must that we have to tackle now, that we have no time for complacency. Because as Judy, Judy clearly stated, what we have has avoided big confrontations. So let's not be complacent with ourselves, thinking that time is there, and before we re really sustain a peaceful world, that is what we need. So many of these conversations. As we've said, we need a new construct, but at the same time, that is about having the political will to move forward with things, and you don't want to just throw the baby out with the bathwater. Where do we go from here? Exactly. We tend to blame the institutions for not delivering, but it's not the institutions, it's us, it's our political will. We, we have created these institutions, to help us to deal with our problems. And we are witnessing some kind of irony right now because the need for cooperation is greater than ever because the challenges we are facing are global in their nature, be it the climate change, be it the poverty and hunger, be it the uncontrolled migration, growing inequalities that are feeding into radicalization. All these are the issues that no country can solve on its own. So we need a, to, to work together and we have created the platforms, we have created the organizations, but at the same time, and that's the second part of the irony, we are not using them. We are, again, witnessing a growing tendency for unilateralism, for enforcing solutions that suit one or a small group of countries by threat of force, economic or even military, or even imposing that. 
Uh, we are, many of us are committed to multilateralism verbally, but then we are flooding the agenda with bilateral issues, not allowing the multilateral uh, bodies to deliver as they were designed. So we, need, we don't need to reinvent the vehicle, but we need to replace the engine. We don't need a new United Nations, but we need to start using United Nations for what it has been created. And, and again, it's the political will which will not come by itself, unfortunately, unless there is a clear demand from the wider public. We've had two years, and leaders globally have had two years to accustom themselves to the new direction from the United States. I want to bring in Bill here because at the end of the day, it's about finding some kind of common ground, isn't it? And when you look at what's been happening over the last couple of years in terms of the Trump doctrine on trade and even on foreign relations and defense, it's changed everything. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, to deal with the scope of the changes that all my colleagues have been talking about, you know, it's important for leaders to apply a sense of enlightened self-interest. In other words, a sense that any country's best interests in this era of profound transition on the international landscape are going to be best served by finding common ground with other countries, not through a kind of muscular unilateralism, which I think just encourages the worst tendencies in other countries as well. I mean, I'm a recovering diplomat, and through most of my 35 years as a diplomat, I represented a country um, which, which I think pursued that sense of enlightened self-interest for all the mistakes we made along the way. And so I'm concerned about an era in which you have an intersection of a profound set of challenges on the international landscape. I mean, the era of globalization euphoria is over with. I mean, that was an era marked by singular American dominance of geopolitics and a sense of kind of irresistible momentum toward open economic and political systems driven by technology and framed by an order that seemed to encourage that. We've entered into a, an era in which power is more diffuse among states with the rise of China and India, the resurgence of Russia, challenges to regional order, especially in this part of the world. Um, but also where power is more diffused beyond states. The technological revolution, climate change, issues that no one state can deal with on its own. And so that, re that really does require is a sense of enlightened self-interest among leaders. I don't mean this as a statement of American arrogance at all, but the United States, even if we're no longer the singular dominant player, is in many ways the pivotal player on the international landscape. And so if we fail to play that role, it's going to enhance the chances that the dark ages are going to persist, and it's going to make it that much harder to bring about the sort of renovation of the international system, international order, that is really sorely needed right now. Eureka, I want to bring you in as well in talking about the future of uh, foreign policy when it comes to technological innovations and the failure that we've seen so far, at least, to communicate when it comes to this U.S.-China trade spat as well. How do we address that issue? Well, you talked about the role, role of foreign policy. And I think well, foreign policy is very important. But I happen to feel that domestic policy is more important than foreign policy when it comes to changes, new challenges, the, like technology, or even climate change, or uh, bad distrib worsen the distribution of income uh, taking place because of uh, globalization. And I think in the first place, it's not quite right to say that the problems, the challenges of um, in bad income distribution is because of globalization. I think uh, domestic redistribution policy is more important than uh, foreign policy on that point, because there are, there are countries with good distribution of income, even enjoying at the same time the globalization. And I, I'm in saying that I am thinking of Japan uh, and maybe Scandinavian countries. Uh, we have the, our law, our law um, stipulates that a company, listed company, will have to report the number of uh, or the names of the um, employees who earn more than 1 million Japanese yen a year, which is 
just about 100 million yen a year, which is just about, uh, no, sorry, 1 million yen. Um, and that's, and you think that there are so many, 100 million yen, sorry, and uh, 100 million yen is right, and which is about 1 million US dollars. And that's, you think that there are just many. I counted some years ago the names, and then I counted just about 400. So that's the extent of the, um, the equality we have in our society. So it really is, uh, depends on uh, the income redistribution policy. But having said that, uh, technology is very important and that will bring in many unknown challenges. And to cope with some of the uh, unknown challenges, we'll have to exchange our views we have to exchange our knowledge, we have to exchange the policies to deal with them, and we need to cooperate. Look at contagious diseases. We need, without the cooperation of the countries, we cannot deal with that. Or look at the cyber issues that we are, have been talking about. Without the right set of rules as to where these big numbers, big data, uh, belong to. We will not be able to make the most of these technologies. So foreign policy in that respect is very important. And I want to bring in Bill Burns here as well because at the end of the day what we've seen since the Second World War is the United States um, really leading the charge when it comes to technological innovation and of course that has to do a great deal with defense spending, that has to do with that level of investment that we've seen from the United States for all of these years. But China is surpassing the United States when it comes to AI and in terms of that level of investment. Things are changing. How do we deal with that going forward? Because that means that the rules that we've seen from the West are being upended. Well, Japan is an Actually, this question neighbor is... to China. And I was oh. just going to have Bill address oh, that. Oh, sorry. Sure. No, well, sure, I, no, I'll be very brief. I mean, I think, you know, obviously the great challenge, not just for the United States, but for lots of countries and societies around the world, is how do you maximize the benefits of technology and minimize the dislocations? And I think, um, you know, the challenge for the United States, I think, is to have a sense of self-confidence. I still think, and again, I don't mean this as a statement of American arrogance, but we're, you know, the most technologically innovative country in the world. But what we're failing to do right now is invest in education, um, invest in the kind of smart leadership that explains to people what the challenges of automation are going to bring in terms of job dislocation, far more than challenges, you know, brought about by open trading arrangements. Um, and helps prepare people to compete even more effectively in the era that lies ahead of us. And I think you have to admire the single-minded way in which the Chinese leadership is investing in artificial intelligence in areas like synthetic biology, which really are going to be the kind of power currency of the decades ahead. So I think the United States, I'm an optimist about the capacity of the United States to continue to play a leading role in those areas, but it's going to require a sense of priority. possible if we do. At the end of the day, when we look at what's been happening, not just in the United States, but certainly with what has happened in Europe, and fears over what Brexit will create in terms of the miscommunication between Europe and former partners, how worried are you? I'm pretty worried. Uh, obviously, the Brexit was a consequence of something, of the inadequate reaction of European Union to the challenges our citizens have been facing since 2009, basically. But it was also a wake-up call. And the European Union, right now, is very united and very much committed uh, to, to address this issue. But let's face it, Brexit is a lose-lose deal. We will be all be losing. The question is how damaging it will be. And the second reason why I'm worried is that we see tectonic changes in the global architecture clearly moving from unipolar world into multipolar world. European Union should have its say, its strong voice, but it's not there because it's busy with uh, its internal agenda. But uh, I don't think anyone should celebrate because of, the, of this, because European Union is based on the rule of law, on understanding of multilateralism, 
and principles of uh, equality and, and respect for rights. So therefore, I really believe that European voice would be highly desired in these global processes. The fact is that the processes are not really regulated. They are happening spontaneously, and whoever feels that this is the opportunity to, uh, to get more space, it's doing that. So the changes are happening, but I would definitely wish for these changes to be a result of a global understanding and, of course, the, the, these changes to be globally governed and globally regulated. So as foreign powers continue, of course, to jockey for position, as they've always done, where does that leave institutions like the UN, like NATO? Are, how damaging is this going to be? Because at the end of the day, what we're trying to do today is to set the agenda for what we're going to be talking about in January at Davos. Julie, if you want to weigh in in terms of um, new rules. Well, interestingly, uh, when Bill spoke about the enlightened self-interest of the United States. I was wondering if that was just a very diplomatic and elegant way of describing President Trump's America First policy, which of course all leaders should put the interests of their nation first. But this hard-edged unilateralism that we're seeing from the United States means that uh, the President is focused on a domestic agenda, but that also means there's a vacuum, and, lay, and let's face it, nature abhors a vacuum, and it's filled. And one example was the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the TPP-12. And in fairness to the Trump administration, both incoming you know, administrations, either a Clinton or a Trump, were against the TPP for, I would suggest, domestic purposes. But once the announcement was made that the US was pulling out, the other nations, the remaining 11, resolved that it was in their interest to pursue this plurilateral arrangement in accordance with the WTO rules, and that we would go ahead regardless. And it's now going through the respective parliaments of countries as diverse as Canada, Mexico, Malaysia, Vietnam, Australia, Japan. And so I think that the institutions, in this instance, um, open, free, liberalised trade, can continue. It just takes leadership of uh, nations to say this is in our interests collectively and we will pursue it. Now, there are newly um, empowered nations that are reluctant to embrace the institutions that evolved from the Second World War, you know, the World Bank or the IMF or the WTO. I think it's incumbent upon us all, particularly nations who've benefited so much from this order, to lead the charge for reform that takes into account the changing world in which we live. And again, as I think we've all collectively said, it's not a question of throwing out the old order and bringing in a new. It's a question of ensuring that the very best aspects of that order that have benefited the majority of countries should be upheld. And if I could I add just a less elegant word on um, self-enlightened interest, enlightened self-interest, and that is that I think President Trump has the self part down very well. It's the enlightened <laughs> part that's still a challenge. Only you can say that. <laughs> Susanna, you're coming at this from a, a background where you've been part of the corporate world. You've been part of um, an international organization, the United Nations, in different capacities. You've been part of a government. Um, how do we meld all of these different institutions here? Because obviously to get things done uh, at a national level, you have to have the political will to do that. And we're seeing again and again uh, in the West that the leaders just don't have that collective political will. So where can the organizations go from there? You know, I, I will go back to the point that Yuriko made about internal policies. It, at the heart of what we are facing here, is the fact that the common citizen does not feel himself or herself represented well enough by the institutions, be them national or international. And there is a break, in my view, in the compact, in the social compact, between the citizens and their leadership. So this is bringing a, an inward-looking perspective for, for the citizens. Citizens feel themselves not, not, not only well represented, but also they feel their future is at stake. And it's not clear for them what the future, why the future is at stake, but they blame on leadership. 
Here comes the opportunity for others to sing voices that bring the idea that we can go back to the past. And guess what? We cannot go back to the past. That's a fact. But not only that we can go back to the past, it's that we go back to a past that it never really existed. So we have a contradiction about these new voices promising something that will not materialize, and the pace of change of new technologies, of the revolution, bringing in That's why I refer to a break in, in, in the institutions. In my view, we need to have leadership, and we go back to mentioning leadership across the panel, to recognize that change is required from bottom up, no doubt, but also change is required from external factors that go beyond what we can manage. And we need to impose we first, because to we collectively doing something smart. We have to introduce that discussion. I think the Davos is an opportunity in a setting that is not as formal as the New York-centric setting of the UN or the Washington-centric setting of IMF and World Bank. There is a need for each one of the leaders to step up, make their case, consider the other's case, and be flexible enough to make arrangements that go beyond the so, so inflexible structures we have today. That's the only way forward, unless we really want to sustain our reality in the dark ages. So often, these kinds of conversations, while they start out going very well, they often get hijacked by the political agendas of whomever is sitting in the chair and has the microphone at the moment. How do we get politicians there? Yes, how do we get the politicians who are thinking about the next generation rather than about the next election? It's a good question. <laughs> Only if they feel the pressure. Being a politician myself, you can trust me. Uh, <laughs> They need to feel the pressure from businesses, from, from the voters, from the citizens. And the citizens are raising their voice right now, and the politicians are not ready to react to it. So uh, this should not be happening in a revol revolutionary way. But obviously, the link between the political leaders and, and, and the people needs to be strengthened, and the com com communication has to run both ways. Because the fact is that, on one hand, we are speaking about the fourth industrial revolution, about the knowledge-based society, about digitalization, informatization, but we must not ignore the fact that there is a parallel reality, which is not virtual, that, uh, and namely that a large part of our population has been left out of it. And uh, we still have more than two billion people who do not have access to drinking water and sanitation. More than one billion of people who do not have access to electricity, which has been the achievement of the second industrial revolution. We are proud that we have three billion people with access to internet, but that also means that we have four billion people who don't, which is the, again, the achievement of the third industrial revolution. And uh, as we are planning for the fourth one, let us not forget that by 2050, this planet will be hosting close to 10 billion people. Are we, with, with the current approach to to global warming, to climate change, to providing everyone with access to basic needs. Is it possible to combine the both? And I really believe that it's about time to start thinking about merging these two realities into one before it's too late and before the, the other one will dictate, uh, of course, the developments uh, of, of the global world. And when we talk about this, obviously, this is a level of communication um, that journalists have traditionally been um, pushing and trying to drive the conversation. But journalists today are targeted in every single country in the world. How do we move beyond that? Because now there are so many voices that most people um, tend to feel that they can't identify a message, um, whether it be from governments or be from competing news or new news sources. How do we move beyond that? Because there is no trust in the traditional institutions anymore, Bill. 
I mean, I think the problem, just as you said, it's not just competing views, it's competing facts right now. And one of the big transformations, which is a byproduct of the information technology revolution, is people can retreat through social media into their own echo chambers, which just reinforce their own sense of what reality is, whether it's fact-based or not. And so, as the minister was describing, I mean, one of the great challenges in bringing to bear pressures against political leaders on issues is based on what? On what set of facts um, when you have so many people who can kind of choose their facts a la carte these days? And that's, I think that's a big challenge in all of our societies. Susanna. Well, there is something we must recognize that citizens have reacted after the 2008 crisis because they saw a huge redeployment of resources to allay the crisis. I mean, for good reasons, going to certain industries, to certain sectors, but they didn't see anything equivalent shifting to somehow compensate the losses that people have suffered from that crisis, but from the shifting reality of the, 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 the fourth revolution. So when people ask leadership, what is there for us? They make a fair question. And this goes back to the point of what kind of internal policies need to be put in place so people reconnect with leadership and start to see hope in the future so that they can trust again their leadership and the institutions they represent, both locally, nationally, or globally. Eureka, I'm a, um, I tend to be a worst case scenario kind of girl. Um, where are we today headed? Because we're talking a lot on this stage about how worried we all are that the architecture that we have in place today isn't working, and that there is serious lack of political will for politicians to do what they need to do and even in order to move us forward in some urgency. Well, before I, I get to that, I just wanted to say uh, regarding the previous conversations, uh, both politicians, media, mass media, and citizens, they, the quality will have to be raised together. You cannot single out politicians. I was in politics until five years ago uh, in the upper house of Japan, and Politicians are elected, and citizens elect the politicians. Mass media, citizens can criticize mass media, but they are influenced by, by mass media. So we are in, we, in a interrelated positions. So one sector, one like politicians, they cannot influence all. Everyone will have to be raised at the same time. There is a saying that, uh, a citizen um, can have the politicians worth their level. And I think that is really well said. Um, about your question of where are we, we are headed, I, I happen to be more optimistic than uh, people are. If there is a glass filled, half filled with water, some people say, this is too bad, the water is just half the glass. And there are other people who say, well, 50% of the glass we is water, it's good. And I happen to feel, associate myself with a ladder. The system is bad, it's messy, there is no proof that we will be better off next year. All these bad things. But we are working, as Julie said, uh, TPP 11 will go into effect by the end of December, this year. The RCEP, the trade uh, discussions that we have with ASEAN and six countries, including China, Japan, Korea, India, Australia, New Zealand, um, that will be agreed upon next year. And we have uh, EU, Japan, trade negotiations. Pe climate change, Paris Accord, has been ratified. It's in, in effect. So there are many bad things, but it will take time, but we are moving. We are not losing the whole thing. It's just that um, we, the public, the uh, civil society, politicians, um, everyone, mass media, and everyone, if we make efforts believing that international cooperation, globalism, 
will bring us something good. And we cannot survive without the benefits of that. I think we will be succeeding in moving forward. It's just that it's not coming today, I mean, well, tomorrow. And technology will require us to move faster. So there is a, a difficulty right there, but uh, I am more optimistic than you, you, you hint. And speaking of that urgency, Julie, when we talk about what needs to happen next, we have a, a U.S. president whose own Department of Defense called climate change the single greatest threat to the future stability globally, and at the same time, he wouldn't sign the Paris Climate Accord. So, so how do we bridge that kind of disconnect? Look, there are a couple of issues that I wanted to pick up on which I think might answer that question. And um, We talk about social media and the fact that everyone virtually can have access to a platform to voice their discontent, voice their views. It does become an echo chamber, and this is where politicians have to show leadership. I've seen in my own country where politicians have responded to an online campaign that didn't represent good public policy, that didn't represent the interests of the nation, but they were spooked into thinking that that's what the Australian people thought collectively, and therefore they would adopt what turned out to be a populist policy. And we are seeing this rise of populism in some unexpected quarters around the world. This has to be resisted because, yes, of course we need to be elected. If we're in a democracy, we've got to be elected, so you want attractive policies. But you have to sit back and think, am I doing this because there's Thomas Sowell has that um, three-point test to determine whether something is populist. And this, we can apply it to climate change, we can apply it to trade. First, what are the competing policies that you put forward? So you're about to adopt a populist policy. Is there a better alternative? Secondly, what's the cost? What is the cost of this populist policy you're putting forward in terms of resources, people, capital, you name it? Because populism doesn't actually worry about cost too often. Third, what's the evidence? What's the evidence base to support this policy? Much of the, I suggest, short-term populist policies fail and you'd see leaders acting and politicians acting in the interests of the country. That applies uh, to many of the challenges that we see today that are being, uh, that are being answered by these short-term populist responses that have a long-term detrimental effect. And we've seen it. We, uh, how many times does history have to show us what industry subsidisation does or what protectionism and closing markets does or what um, um, unaffordable uh, support for a welfare state does to a nation? So. I think that's a debate we have to have. And in terms of that, Miroslav, because at the end of the day, well, it's something that we've seen um, again and again in US politics. If you don't toe the party line, you have a pretty short shelf life. How can politicians navigate this? Because at the end of the day, you are elected officials. Um, and what we've seen in the past is that it doesn't necessarily go very well for the Mavericks. Yes, uh, the fact is that uh, we are clearly seeing the lack of trust uh, from our people. Uh, they, they trust less, if ever, institutions, politicians, sometimes even facts. And the more a information we get and the easier is the ex access to information, the more confused people seem, seem to be. Uh, and this is something we need to address because then they react, of course, through all the possible means of, of expressing them. At the same time, not that I disagree with conspirator, and sometimes I have the feeling that it's enough that you don't share my views, and I will immediately label, label you a populist or some of the other things. So. What, what we are lacking in this situation, and as I said already, these are fundamental changes. So uh, we need to sit down, we need to use every possible for us to discuss 
where this planet, where this civilization is heading. And uh, of course, the WEF is a perfect setting for that because it, it brings together uh, experts from the governments, from business sector, from academia. So this is a, this is a, a, a fantastic platform to discuss it. Uh, because otherwise, we are lacking a genuine dialogue. So as if, and I mean, with my 30 years of diplomatic experience, I see less and less dialogue and less and less commitment to dialogue. Even when we meet and when we talk, it's like exchange of monologues. Coming to the, to the platform, being convinced that I'm right, and if you, if you don't share my, my views, that means you are my enemy or you are a popular. And I might, must be able to listen to others and learn something and in the end to arrive at a platform where we can all agree. And, and this is, I think, we are living in times when this is needed more than ever before. So as a, once, once again, to stress the point that the changes are happening, the question is whether we are in control of these changes or we are just reacting to these changes. Bill, do you want to weigh in here? Um, I mean, only to say that I share the optimism that was just described um, in the sense that, as Borga Brenda mentioned earlier, I mean, technology has, the advances in, in science and technology have produced enormous human advances, whether it's the hundreds of millions of people lifted out of poverty and into the middle class, advances in, in human health and life expectancy, unimaginable 40 or 50 years ago. But I think to make that optimism real, leaders are going to have to do at least a couple things. One is to have a sense of real urgency, um, because a lot of technological changes and their challenges right now are outpacing. Society, I think. and also to have some understanding of the very real anxieties that have driven the kind of anti-globalization atmosphere in the US. There were many people in my society whose boats weren't lifted by globalization. Um, inequality has become a bigger and bigger problem. There's real anxiety and fear, and it's a huge mistake to dismiss that, but you've got to address it with smart policy, and that's what good leadership is. About this in terms of um talking to people on their level and being able to communicate 10 to 20 years in terms of messaging. What needs to be the message to these leaders when we gather in Davos in just a couple of months? Well, two or three things I will emphasize. First, we are, as the result of the availability of technology, we are living in an age of disintermediation. People have access directly to whatever they have access. It can be the true or not, but they have access. That empowers people. People do not need newspapers because they have other means of access. They don't need politicians to tell them what to do. They for sure don't need the UN to tell them what to do. So this intermediation is a big element of our new reality. About democracy in a broader sense. I always hear about democracy associated to electoral processes. That's necessary, but far from enough. Democracy is much more than just the electoral processes. And the electoral processes be, bring sh very short-term views, as Miroslav was just talking about. That might happen in 10, 15 years' time if I will not survive in the electoral process. Citizens are really, really uh, upset with, in some parts of the world, uh, the fact that the public monies have been misutilized. The fact that people do not, ex I mean, the way 
the common citizen. So how the just mere factor of being elected on one side, the notion of our citizens being disintermediated in our dialogue is another element where the things beyond the next two years is critical. Because it's also true that there are societies in the world that think much longer term, and that really is another shift in power because it allows to take decisions with a different perspective. And that really leads me into my final question I'd like to pose for each of the panelists. Um, we're talking about a society in which uh, Asia, China, for example, leading the fight with AI, leading the investment case uh, in AI as well. not necessarily autonomous. Are we talking about the best way forward is a benevolent the future going to look like? That um, whatever will come out after corporate The term, uh, what we need is a platform, public partnership, public-private partnership, um, civil society, business, government, the leadership of these sectors need to join in the same platform, discuss for our think really uh, come out through through our cooperation is name naming it is comes afterwards substance what the actual cooperation fruits, I think, are the most important thing that count. Bill, do you want to take a stab at that? Um, well, I mean, I think technology is obviously a double-edged uh, phenomenon. I mean, it can be used for huge human advances, but it can also be used to deepen the surveillance control in authoritarian states as well. Um, and I think the challenge, especially in, in democratic systems, is to revive our own sense of purpose and demonstrate that we can harness technology um, for ends that are gonna benefit the human dignity of all citizens, that we can work with other countries of whatever political stripe to try to develop sensible rules of the road for dealing with technological advances. So in a sense, much as I'm concerned about the dangers that technology can be abused to deepen surveillance states, I think a lot of the challenge is with us. It's, it's how do we use in democratic systems uh, technology as ways to bolster um, those kind of more open and political and economic systems. Julie. I think history has shown that for a nation to reach high income status, it's more likely to do so if it's a representative democracy. There are some exceptions, and I think we're sitting in one, so there are some exceptions in the world. But as representative democracies, and I think there's a lesson there. Uh, the point of technology being there's a positive and a negative, is where the international rules-based order comes into play again. Uh, we need rules of the road, whether it's in cyber or physically. Uh, we need to have a set of rules 
by which nations are uh, responding, how they behave, and how they behave towards each other. So however the technological revolution unfolds, we are still going to need a framework of rules sat in Brussels over who's going to be fined next, whether they be Google or Facebook or any of the other companies. Because it has to be about, it has to be inclusive and it has to include some kind of regulation for corporates. Yes, and that's exactly the word I wanted to stress that I consider crucial, inclusivity. It is so important that, I mean, there is a popular saying in the United Nations, leave no one behind. And, and the fact is that if you are not part of the process, you can hardly be expected to support it. And if you have become a victim of the process, then obviously you will stand up against it. So therefore, when planning our policies at national level, at global level, we will have to think about the greatest possible level of inclusivity. In Europe, for example, thanks to social networks, uh, people want to be part of, of, of the governance, and they have many means how to let uh, their feelings uh, known, and they don't need to wait, as Susanna just said, for the next uh, elections. So the, the feedback is immediate and, it, and it's very quick. And uh, on, on the global level, when we speak about uh, reshaping the global order, the majority of states on this planet are small countries or medium-sized countries. So if someone believes that we can have And when we are planning the big initiatives and millions or billions of people who might not have access to, to our inventions and to our policies, this will backfire on us again. So therefore, inclusivity means the reality check on everything we are doing. And I would like to stress the importance of this. And Susanna, I want to close with you, because you did call this time, this globalization 4.0, a renaissance. But as we know, renaissance it means a, a flood of new ideas and exciting technologies, but it also can be extremely painful. <laughs> Indeed. And I will go back to your point on, on democracy. You know, since the fall of, of the Berlin Wall, there was a, a, a broad sense that liberal democracy, as it's known, will be fully associated to capitalism and that they will mutually reinforce themselves and that will be dissolution for societies. 2008 proved that we are not there, that somehow the, the trickle down of, of the distribution did not take place and that created a chain reaction. So going back to the point that Mirzlap made on, on inequality, that is at the center of the fracture. So on one side, the technological revolution is an opportunity to really reduce the inequality gap. On the other side, it's a huge challenge because some may be left beside, left behind in, in this revolution. So how to think through a ways and policies to administer, to manage this process in a, at a pace that is really huge, that has no precedence, that is what we have to work on. And that's why I go back to the notion of this is happening now, and we cannot allow for time to pass without doing anything about it, because it will play against all peoples. There are two things I just want to add. One is inclusiveness, and it's very good that the world just has come to a point where inclusiveness is important. But since the technological progress is very fast, this is the time we begin to think to incorporate efficiency element into inclusiveness. Now, and my hope is that this um, technology will make it easier for us to include 
efficiency element into this inclusiveness. Another element we'll have to think is who is going to pay to support the infrastructure of international institutions. Now, uh, some countries will have to pay. And in the past, countries like the US led the support of the, the system. And this is going to be a question. And again, I hope that the new technology will make it easier for us to assemble the necessary cost to what we need. So these two elements we need to think when we think of uh, platform and international institutions in the future. Globalization 4.0, what it's exactly going to look like and who is going to pay for it. Thank you, panelists, for joining us. This is going to kick off two days of very interesting conversations for the World Economic Forum and CNBC News. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you.